Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 1963. We're going to be taking a look at Lonnie Johnson and he's going to be playing through another night to cry. So let's get Lonnie up on screen and see how he gets on. crying over you Well, I've got another night to cry Another night to cry over you You hurt me so bad and so long And there's nothing I can do When I say I love you And walk away with somebody else You can't keep on hurting me Unless you get hurt yourself You can't keep on hurting me Unless you get hurt yourself Cause you misusing ways, baby It's drove me to somebody else going to jump in here because Lonnie Johnson, I mean, he was one of the guys in terms of being born in 1899 and playing the guitar in such a way that he's playing individual notes, individual lead notes, especially with the blues here, but he was actually more of a jazz musician. And it's just funny how things worked out that he then got known for blues. But the way that he plays, you've got to remember that in the late teens and early 20s, I'm talking about 1919 and 1920, playing the guitar was a totally different thing. So somebody going off and rather than using it as a rhythm instrument, but using it as a lead instrument, it's one of these things that it wasn't normally done. Picking out single notes with a pick like Lonnie did. So he was one of those trailblazers that absolutely started playing the guitar in a different way. Of course, now we just see lead guitar as lead guitar, but it's great to have a look back. Obviously here in 1963, this is when Lonnie's 64 years old. So he had so many weapons in his arsenal musically, but also he was the inspiration for guys like Django Reinhardt, who I've got a video on here in this channel and check out him if you don't know who he is but such great players of later generations looked at this guy and coming from that era means that Lonnie's got that super clean tone because there weren't any stomp boxes and distortion and delay and all those effects that we're used to now so he just had to get his own sound from that really clean tone and it might have been one of those reasons why a lot of players didn't get into playing single notes because they might not have thought 
thought it sounded very good, at least when they were playing it. Listening to this blues, it's such a solid blues, but also the fact that his voice is so accurate, so clean, so expressive, and he's telling that story. And right at the beginning of the performance, we could hear that the reverb on the mic was really excessive. It gives it a ghostly quality, but then they dial it in and dial it back so that we actually get to hear that really cool tone that Lonnie's got with his voice. And it's also great to know that there is a sound guy who is making sure the sound is good. And Lonnie, when he's playing, he's been living through that totally different time where you're seeing this video that that the audience is exclusively white. So the black players back, I know this is in the mid 60s, but even still in the mid 60s, the views and the acceptance still hadn't really fully come around yet. So just being given that time on stage, it was so tough for black players in order to play to a mass audience especially if it was a white audience. And Lonnie's got that kind of music that could bridge that gap because you just watch him play and listen to his voice and he can absolutely connect with anybody. It doesn't matter. And that's the great thing about music is that you can connect to any artist and it isn't about color. It's just always about the music. And there's a point in the video where we look at the drummer and within that section, if you listen to the guitar, Lonnie's actually doing a sweep on his guitar and it's just raking down the strings. But one of those techniques that has been more prevalent in probably the 1980s, so we're still talking kind of 30, 40 years. I don't know how long that Lonnie has been doing that in terms of his playing, maybe from when he was 20 and then in his 30s. So these techniques that he's throwing together as well, especially if you're not looking at the guitar and if you're listening to it, especially back in those days, you'd be wondering, what is he doing to get that sound? And Lonnie started playing at a young age and performing at a young age as well. In his teenage years, he'd play in a band with his dad and his brother at banquets and weddings and all that kind of thing. And when I say about him growing up in a totally different time, it's hard to get your head around, but the thing that drives it home for me is that in 1917, he went over to England to perform with a theatre company. And then two years later, when he returned, he found out that his brother was the only one left out of his family alive because of the 1918 influenza epidemic. And that kind of thing really drives it home that there's no way of contacting each other from the England to the USA. And when he returned, this is when he's finding out about it. And what horrific news to have to return to your town and hear from your brother that the rest of your family has died. And there just wasn't the treatment. There wasn't the technology and everything that we know now. It was such a different time where illnesses could wipe out millions of people. And in 1925, Lonnie entered a competition where the prize was a recording contract. But the only problem was that it was a blues competition. And Lonnie being into jazz, it wasn't really his strong suit. But he did say himself that at that point he would have done anything to land a record deal and do music full time. So he entered this competition and he ended up winning it, even though it wasn't his preferred style of playing. So it just goes to show you what a well-rounded player he was in order to beat other blues players in that blues competition. So having won that competition and now being seen as more of a blues artist, the record label, by the way, was OK Records. And he went on to do over 130 recordings with them. He was also used as a session guy on the label because he was so good playing on other people's recordings. Also in 1927, he was a guest artist with Louis Armstrong as well. So having that ability, I think being seen as a blues artist, but then people could actually see that in the studio, hang on, this guy can play so many different styles. And he certainly did. And in the studio, he used to play a 12 string as well. And that's a sound that certainly did start to change how the guitar was coming across. And especially guys like Django Reinhardt would be influenced, especially by Lonnie's playing on that 12 string and how he transformed the sound of the guitar. Let's remember as well that Lonnie lived through the Great Depression, which of course hit the music industry as well. So it meant during that time he had to work in a steel mill. But fortunately, when that all got turned around, he then came back to music. And also, let's bear in mind that he didn't play an electric guitar for the first time until 1939. So all of his techniques, all of his style was on an acoustic guitar, classical guitar and 12 string guitar, like I mentioned. So playing lead on those instruments, it was such an 
inspiration for those other players, other classical players and jazz players especially, because Lonnie was turning the guitar into an instrument that you can now give a jazz voice, and he really brought a new dimension to it. So by the late 30s, he was playing and recording with Decca Records, and also he released 34 tracks with Bluebird Records. So it was all going well, but unfortunately war broke out, and he then had to obviously have a break. Fortunately, he got back into music afterwards, and in 1948 is when he released his track called Tomorrow Night, and that got to number one in the charts, and it maintained that position for seven weeks, and it sold over three million copies in all which when you think of the time, 1948, and the fact that there wasn't loads of adverts that you could watch on TV, it's just mostly all on the radio, it's really impressive the amount of sales that Lonnie made in that period. So fast forwarding 10 years, in 1959, Lonnie was working as a janitor and was still playing music. And let's bear in mind that he was about 60 years of age at this time. So he'd had a great career up to that point. And he actually got searched out by a DJ called Chris Albertson. And from that, he actually made an album and still got out there, still played, even though he was still advancing in years. And in 1965, he was playing at a gig and it was just a four people, but then he started playing at other venues and people started to turn up and watch this guy because he was so good. So then he decided to open up his own club and that was in 1966. And this was in Toronto because he found that the racial tension was a lot lower there and he felt a lot more comfortable, hence why he opened this club and could just play and perform there. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, it was a bit of a failure and eventually he had to quit and sell it. So unfortunately, that business venture didn't work out well. And sometimes that's the case with really artistic people. Getting into the business side of it is really difficult. And Lonnie certainly found that with the club that he opened. And unfortunately, in 1969, he was walking along the sidewalk and he got hit by a car. And it was pretty serious because he broke his hip and had kidney injuries as well. And there's a benefit concert that was held after this event and unfortunately Lonnie never really fully recovered from that and he had a stroke. His last performance was in 1970 with Buddy Guy and he got a standing ovation for that performance but unfortunately he passed away in June of that year 1970. Let's get back into the performance. Go on and have your fun Do anything you want to do And like I said, a totally different time, just looking at that audience. And another thing to notice that's a sad thing to notice about this video really is that his guitar strap is just a piece of rope that you would find on some curtains with the tassel on the end because you can see it just wrapped around the guitar and just hanging down below the headstock, that tassel. And when he did die in 1970, he was almost penniless. And it is sad to think that such a pioneer of guitar and playing and lead guitar and jazz as well, the fact that he inspired so many generations after him, and then those players inspired the future generations after them as well. And to think that he was penniless and when he died in 1970 he died in Toronto but then they moved his body friends and family did over to Philadelphia but he didn't have a gravestone and he was in an unmarked grave until 2014 and that's where Killer Blues Headstone Project got involved and they give old blues players headstones on their graves but it took until 2014 for that to actually happen so a bit of a sad end to the story considering 
what an influential guy this was as a player to so many other players that came afterwards. And after his death, he was inducted into the Louisiana Blues Hall of Fame in 1997. And it's great just to put a spotlight on Lonnie because of the way that he played. And he really did change the way that the guitar was played by taking a pick and striking strings, playing strings individually. But thank you so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at and keep those suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think and if you like this video please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock!